Hello and welcome to The Public Good. This is Deja James from Partnership for the Public Good or PPG, which unites over 340 community organizations working to build a better Buffalo. We're delighted to join you every Tuesday morning at 11.30 a.m. on Power 96.5 FM and Mix 1080 a.m. You can also watch full video of every show on our YouTube page. Follow PPG Buffalo on Facebook, Instagram, or wherever you get your information for socials um, for how to access the video and full podcast of the show. And of course, you can always get great information on our website, ppgbuffalo.org. Um, we also, before we introduce our guests, I want to highlight that there's a way you can listen and interact with us here on The Public Good. Um, email us at info at ppgbuffalo.org to let us know your ideas for change, what you'd love to hear on the show, any responses you've had to past shows. We'd love to hear from you. Please, we encourage commentary, questions, or feedback on any episode. Reach out at info at ppgbuffalo.org. Be sure to let us know where you're listening from and who you are. This week is my favorite week and my favorite month, um, not only because I'm born in it, but because we are kicking off Black History Month and we are cutting straight to the white meat today. No pun intended, maybe a little pun intended. <laughs> I am joined by a few of the featured speakers from an upcoming installment of Say Yes Buffalo's Think Tank series. This one being called White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of Our Nation's Divide. I'm gonna let that breathe for a moment, but this event will take place February 15th from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at WNED Studios. You all describe this event um, as organized resistance to black progress through education and workforce development. There's a lot to unpack with all of that. So I'm just gonna let us start here today with you introducing yourselves. I know we're only gonna be able to give a teaser of this larger discussion you're gonna have um, and this larger body of work of White Rage the book. Um, but first, let I'll just have you all introduce yourselves um, to the community. Sure, I'll start. I'm Stephanie Pete. I'm Director of Workforce Development at Say Yes. Um, so I lead our workforce po portfolio and our racial equity work with our employers. And I also um, co-own Second Chapter Bookstore. Hi, Will Green. Um, so I have, wear a couple different hats. University of Buffalo, uh, Assistant Dean of Outreach and Community Engagement. And I'm also the owner and CEO, Principal Operator of Tremonti Solutions. We focus on racial and cultural conflicts within schools and educational settings. Awesome, and I'm Akua Menzedu. I am the President and Principal Consultant at Clementine Gold Group. Uh, we're an equity-centered strategy and planning firm in Buffalo, New York. Got about four different core areas. Um, equity is involved in all of those, so education and facilitation. Uh, we do a lot of community engagement, strategy, and inclusive economic development. Happy to be here. Thank you all for being here. And I just want to hop right into it. What is white rage? What is this discussion you're having? What what kind of was the impetus of you all coming up with this event and participating in a discussion like this on Black History Month, no less? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, white rage, uh, how she describes it is a response to not just black people existing, but black people wanting to live with dignity and having ambition. So mm -hmm. it isn't, you know, violence that we can see on the street, but it's more so how um, folks who want to maintain white supremacy do it through legislation, through public policy, and they undercut any black progress. But how we got to this, so I recommended this book on LinkedIn. Um, the original idea was just to do a quiet, you know, uh, private discussion that say yes, but some key folks who requested it, um, I did an interview with Jay Moran at Buffalo What's Next. He saw the book and said, hey, I want to record it when you discuss it. Mm -hmm. So long story short, everybody kept <laughs> requesting it and it turned into this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> so then now it's this larger event. Yeah. They were like, no, we need to do some more here. It's yeah. not just a closed door thing. We yeah. need to be so, open in this. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, I'm wondering what and i know you said you're the one who kind of saw the book and but mm -hmm. for you when you engage with this work in particular why did you feel it was so important for you to share it especially in the times that we're in now mm -hmm. um but what really stood out to you in terms of the discussion that white rage presents to us as a community yeah. i just think it's really important to talk about the history because mm -hmm. none of us learned a com we didn't learn the true history of yeah. our country mm -hmm. in school growing up you know mm -hmm. um so I think we talk about, you know, a lot about DEI and anti-bias and, you know, all of those yeah. things that are, it's great to engage in trainings and PD like that, but it's like, do we really understand how we got here? Yeah. So I think this book is really powerful in that, like, 
I love her writing. This is probably the second or third book I've written by her. And I think she does a really good job at really getting to the meat of it yeah. in a really digestible way. And I yeah. just think it's important for folks to know how we got here. So I think that will create a sense of urgency in doing something about it from wherever they sit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And on the panel discussion that you are going to have, you have representatives from the white community, mm -hmm. from yourselves, from the black community, everything like that. How important for you was it to have this conversation be a cross-cultural, cross-racial mm -hmm. conversation and not... A lot of the times it's like us, we have the conversation right, right 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 like we already know right. right but how important is that to include that other per perspective i guess you could say in the in a conversation as such um well you want to have a well-rounded conversation and i think the truth is so me being an educator and yeah. coming into education in the late 1900s <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how they're saying it too. <laughs> i mean that's how I, exactly but you know also having educational mentors who studied black history, who taught me about black history. There was always a conversation about, yeah. and I love how it stated, white rage is usually in um, opposition of black progress, mm -hmm. even perceived black mm -hmm. progress. Mm -hmm. right. And there are some things that we ourselves as black folk don't even know about the history mm -hmm. of white rage, how it was represented, not just in physical action, but in legislation and laws and these backdoor deals being done. So it's good to have those conversations with cross-cultural groups so everybody can understand the history of it and look at their place in it. Right. You know what's so interesting about what you all are highlighting is that it's not just white people who don't know the history mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. don't see Absolutely. it. It's even us ourselves who have that lived experience, who have grandparents, who have mothers, who have brothers, sisters, mm -hmm. cousins in this situation as well. Like we don't even know why we're we are in our own circumstances. Yeah. And I, and obviously, I think that has been purposeful for us to kind of the wool over the, our eyes and everything like that. Um, but I'm really happy that. One, this work, body of work and that you guys are uplifting this body of work and that really tries to address the totality of why we don't know the history that we know um, for all communities, not just for the white community or for the black community, but for all of us to understand that. Um, and I think from our own lived experiences, we'll be able to digest that differently. Um, but it's important that 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 base level is set. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why each of you personally want to participate in a discussion like this like what and all of you have have mentioned in your work that you essentially do DEI work in your everyday life but what brought you to that and for me I know for me it's like I'm black I don't have a choice but I don't know what <laughs> that answer is for I other people so I'm always like <laughs> curious as to what made you feel like this is what I want to do for even like my career mm -hmm. space um I, I don't know who wants to start but Y'all yeah. pointing to me. Okay, um, I'll start. Yeah, I'll start in that way. I think for me, it was it was experiences that I had as an employee in organizations. Yeah. Um, not just you know white led organizations, but in general, right? Like the there were a lot of opportunities that you would have to kind of force yourself to get into. But I think oftentimes it was just the experience that we didn't talk to you know, your organ, like your organized employer about, right? There were a lot of conversations that I think we would have um, in the background just saying like, wait, did you experience that? Yeah. Because I, you know, I kind of experienced this and you would find that it wasn't a proportionate experience that everyone had, right? So even, and my white colleagues in some of these organizations, they would recognize and notice, oh, I see the way that you're treated. It's a little bit different mm -hmm. in this way. And so I would say, you know, in my career, even you know, the last organization that I worked for before going out on my own, I had HR reporting up through me. And in those experiences, you would see how decisions were being made and, and what inflection point those decisions were being made. And when you would enter into a room, you know, and say there was a white supervisor, they perceived it a little bit differently than I would have, right? In terms of how they were operating. And so for me, it was like, how do you get to a point where you're in an organization within a system. How do you change that system? Because there's a lot of systemic things that are happening, but you have to work through this individual who's operating within the system. And yeah. so for me, I wanted to get integrated into organizations to really start to do this work and change the, that perception um, and lived experience that we all had to go through. So it was really like, you know, working internal to get to a point where the outcomes were, were different. How, and how amenable, I guess, would you say, are organizations to yeah. <laughs> recognizing that that yeah. change needs to happen? But then also, I think, especially in 2020, with all everything going on and the uprisings, people were like, oh, yeah, we have to do something or at least we have to make ourselves look good. Mm -hmm. We, we mm -hmm. like black people. Mm -hmm. Let's look like we mm -hmm. like black people. 
But then when it came to like, okay, what does your seat suite look like? Yeah. How do you change the way you're yeah. allocating funds? How do you do this? It was like, whoa, like we just thought we could post a black yeah. square, right? Yeah, or and there were like, <laughs> many organizations that did a yeah. lot of the performative, you know, type work. I yeah. mean, even to this day, one of the things that we do within organizations are what we call a cultural audit, which is a year long engagement where we're immersing ourselves into the culture and really, you know, seeing how you operate as an organization. And you would see in a lot of these organizations, it's nice to say, but when you're when you're talking about actually changing a, a process or changing a system, yeah. then you start to see like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Like I, I knew we wanted to do this work, but I didn't realize it was gonna touch this specific component. When you're talking about pay equity and what that looks like right. in organizations, eh, yeah, we're all for it, but ah, uh, you know, maybe that could be, you know, an area that we get to at yeah. some point in time. So I think it just depends on how real that organization's being with themselves and right. that is coming down to you know leadership saying we're open to this we're going to go through this change it's not necessarily easy change but you know mm -hmm. we know that's going to be for the betterment of the organization especially because we're becoming a plurality yeah. right and yeah. so this the dem the demographics aren't going to be like this forever they're already shifting in the city of buffalo alone now yeah. it's 53 percent you know people of color bipoc community and 47 percent white yeah so when you start to see those shifts you're going to have more clashes in organizations um and needing to really just put, position yourself to operate with a with a different lens that's so interesting yeah. that you say that that population shift oh yeah um, oh yeah as we should know the you know the city buffalo's like we've grown for the first time and it's because right. of immigrants right. and right. all this other stuff but then we see these marginalized groups still aren't equally represented exactly. in exactly. positions of power in a lot of different sectors so yeah. that's really interesting um you mentioned essentially that a pathway for you to this is kind of just your life as a black oh, professional. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like it's just the experience yeah. that you literally had. I'm wondering if that's a similar experience for Stephanie or Will of it's mm -hmm. like, this is just something I went through. I noticed the pattern and I'm, I'm just, just, I had to do something about it. Um, similar. Um, so I really got involved in this work when I started working with the business community. So we had an internship program where we were kind of like being the connector between our students in college and local employers um, and we did a ton of work on the student end to prep them for the spaces mm -hmm. and that's where we thought the majority of our energy was going to be and then we quickly realized no yeah. <laughs> there needs to be a lot of prep on the employer end so we started having conversations that we weren't necessarily seeing in other places where we're a little bit more direct and it's coming unfiltered from black and brown folks who yeah. live and work in this community um, and then our employers were really receptive to it and they actually asked can you do this more often we don't have these conversations where we are yeah so that really led to us turning this into a full suite of services so um you know even our network nationally um we're the only community that we know of that actually embeds racial equity mm -hmm. into all 12 months of the year when working with employers it's like embedded in our MOU, uh, so we operationalize mm -hmm. it as well. Mm -hmm. So it's like this is part of working with us um, and tapping into our young talent. So, yeah, so it just kind of happened and it was, you know, a natural evolution of our work. Um, you know, a lot of folks will say putting black and brown kids in white spaces is diversity work and it's not. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. just putting black and brown yeah. kids into white yeah. spaces. Yeah. If you're not going to challenge norms and systems like a cool just talking mm -hmm. about that's the actual equity yeah. work. That's yeah. the DEI work. So if you're not going to do that then you're in my opinion you're just putting kids in harmful situations yeah. exactly. because mm -hmm. and we don't think that we can like oh I'm gonna snap my finger you're gonna come to this training right. and we're gonna fix everything. No. But if we're not willing to have that conversation first, yeah. we're leaving that kid to do yeah. it first, and that's not right. No, no, not at all. Will. Yeah, I mean, so I think Aku and Stephanie are on point for me coming into my professional self as an educator. Yeah. And having veteran black educators, yeah. I was joining a history, mm. yeah. right? So there's a history behind the work that I'm doing. And in order to address the trauma and the issues happening in a classroom. I had to know history mm -hmm. and what truly happened so I could share this information with my students so they could be armed and ready for what they faced in the future. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't just hold on to the idea that, oh, well, they didn't teach us this. That's why the stories aren't shared. Yeah. A lot of the stories aren't shared because generations before us were traumatized Ooh. by the stories. Wow. Yeah. So how difficult is it to tell you of a story, when, tell a child of yours coming up in a very similar mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. that you were dehumanized, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So for me, 
it's giving voice to all those voices okay. before us who didn't have the opportunity to share the story. And to Stephanie's point, so when young people come into these spaces again, yeah. they do not have to deal with that. We're going to cut that right off. Yeah. They will not be traumatized in these spaces. They are whole valuable human beings and they will be treated as such in these spaces and they come in armed with that information and we provide them with the ways and means to deal with that in those spaces yeah. like this here we need to bring it up yeah. um systems change is a huge piece but for me i'm carrying on a tradition yeah. right look at this as you and i'm so proud of you deja i'm so <laughs> proud of you this is one you. of my former uh workshop participants yes okay. i am at buffalo okay. prep sat so yes, i'm so I proud am. to see awesome. her just elevating and doing her thing but akua stephanie business owners elevated in your field of work i'm working at one of the most recognizable institutions mm -hmm. but none of us get to these spaces in buffalo yeah. one of the most segregated cities in america yeah. without the blood being shed oh, of yeah. people who came before us and made sacrifices yeah so i think about that every day that i do this work yeah mm -hmm. every day that i do this work somebody bled for me to get here yeah. and i gotta show up mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that to yep. honor that sacrifice mm -hmm. and i love that because just like you are right now it was how you were when i was 15 years old <laughs> <laughs> and for me, you don't know how much that impacted me as a young person, mm. seeing you be your true, authentic self 100 mm. percent in a space that I mean, at the time, Buffalo Prep was just a room of us. Mm -hmm. Right. And like being able to have that safe space and a, a quote unquote adult figure, mentor figure being that mm. real person. Mm -hmm. I don't know realistically if I would be where I was today without seeing that example set in that way. And I think you're so right that there are so many generations, like in my grandfather's generation, people who were in that movement of the civil rights, who post civil rights, it's like after the 80s, they didn't speak about it anymore. It was like, hush. It was like 90s, we're in this perfect post-racial society. Yeah. We got living single. We got a different world. <laughs> and everything's all cool. We could watch Fresh Prince. Exactly. Right. And so when I but when I was younger, a young kid in the 90s, I'm watching TV thinking, well, it's great for black people. Yeah. But then yeah. in my actual experience, and then I go, and my mom put me in private school, mm -hmm. and they calling me something else. And mm -hmm. I'm like, whoa, this isn't what happened to a different world. Like, right. I thought this was. It's a different world. And and it is exactly and so it's just but i didn't have anybody until i got into high school and i met people like you from and frankly i do think it is a generational thing that felt like no i have to speak about my real experience and i think that's so impactful for young people to see that so that they can be modeled on what to do um, or feel like there's a safe person for them to right. come talk to. Because right. I think sometimes you're not going to know what to do. And that's fine. I mean, I don't think any of us really know mm -hmm. what to do, but we're trying. Um, but feeling like we have somebody to talk to mm -hmm. about that or that there's a space that is talking mm -hmm. about that. Um, like this one that you all are creating is just so important. So I just love that you you pointed that out. Um, I want to talk about a little bit, though, you you're all trying to hold this space and you're working. But we've talked about what that climate is like as a black professional, that you're trying to do that systems change. And there was a point in 2020 where organizations were like, yeah, we have to do that change. Mm -hmm. Everybody was agreeing. It looked like people were changing. It looked like, oh, maybe we're making some progress. And now it's like we've just hit rewind or there's that mm -hmm. white rage coming yep. out of yep. like, no, this y'all got too much now. Y'all doing too much. So how are you how do you combat that? How do we combat that? this new wave of of kind of that reactionary anti-dei anti-blackness we uh, this is an ouchie we don't want to be called racist we don't want to be acknowledging these things because they label that the racist thing mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so how how difficult is it to be having this conversation for you guys to be pushing for us to keep having these conversations in a in a climate like this we're in an election year you know we're, everybody's a little scared right now yeah. What do we do? I mean, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but like, how, what do we do, y'all? I'm I mean, scared. For us, we work with the willing. There's always going to be people who will never come yeah. and partner with us because of what we stand on. Yeah. We are not trying to reach them, to be honest, yeah. because that's, you know, there's a disconnect in values. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The fact that we had this event called White Rage and we have like 125 mm -hmm. or so folks, primarily from the business community, from philanthropy, CEOs who are willing to have this conversation, yeah. like we have to focus on that or else you'll get frustrated, yeah. at least personally. Yeah. Yeah. Like you just, you look at the lack of progress and you just get so mad that you're not like tearing the system down. That's 
you yeah. want to tear it down, you know, or pull it up from the root. But instead we focus on, okay, you're at the table. Okay, let's work. Mm -hmm. And that's all we can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, you definitely want to keep the doors open for folks to come in and take space. But one of the things is, as us being at the forefront, and I'm, you know, it's Black History Month, speaking as Black people in America, yeah. right? Drawing from that history of resistance, mm -hmm. we got to keep the fire lit. Mm -hmm. right. We got to keep the fire lit. And if they open up the door an inch, we push that sucker open a foot yeah. and make sure that we don't back away from very difficult conversations and be authentic about mm -hmm. how we express them. Take no shorts, hold no quarters, give them exactly what it is. This is our opportunity to take all the pain that folks before us have internalized mm -hmm. and to show them what it really means while they are listening because all we can do is once again show them tell them and if they choose to turn away they choose to turn away turn away but at some point we inspire others to have that same type of bravery yeah. and i think it's really important because when we have these conversations it's not to point fingers it's saying look this is what happened this is what is yeah we have these solutions that we think you know they've shown promise we've made some progress like come join us, like come, you know, this is your role, this is our role, and let's do this together to change what we see in our community. So I yeah. think that's really the power in it, that we're not having folks come in. I mean, if you feel a little guilt, we always tell them, like if something, <laughs> something stings, like write it down and interrogate it later, mm -hmm. like don't run from it. But we all have a role to play to make sure that we are dismantling what mm -hmm. she's talking about in this book. Yeah. I think another uh, piece to, to kind of sit with too, because you know we, we have clients that obviously are in, in Buffalo in this area, but also clients you know over the US at this point. And you, you're starting to see some of the shifts that you're talking about where, you know, it was a function like diversity and inclusion was a function in its own people. Yep. I, I want to say it was like one of the most hired positions after George mm -hmm. Floyd in 2020. Mm -hmm. And everybody was excited to do this work and knew they had to do something. Um, now you're starting to see that shift a little bit. It's going back into HR spaces mm -hmm. to be contained in, in that space uh, by itself. But I, I would say for Buffalo, you know, we had a white rage moment going on, what, two years ago mm -hmm. now, May 14th, you yeah. know, where this conversation is extended for us, right? Because it was something that happened right in our community yeah. that we'll never be able to forget. A lot of us knew people who were impacted by that if you didn't know victims themselves yeah. um, in that racist shooting at, at Tops. And so I think for us, we, we have to continue the conversation because it's it's, you know, my office is literally a block away from where that incident happened. So I see it every single day. Um, I think the other piece, and Will, you kind of mentioned this before, but in reading this book, you know, and, and I have to kind of like read at certain times because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you feel it's, it's a heavy book. You <laughs> yeah. feel the visceral reaction after, you know, you're kind of encountering some of this information, but it is that ancestral nod where it was like, okay, we're dealing with what we're dealing with in this day and age you know, where we can still move around. We still have, you know, a certain amount of independence mm -hmm. and autonomy. Whereas when you're reading this and going through the different chapters and phases, like, okay, after Emancipation Proclamation, now you got these black codes that exist that, yeah. that did not allow you to go get employment wherever you wanted. It was this farce, and honestly, it's a gaslighting. So yeah. I'm, I'm reading this book and I'm like, wow, you know, now I'm now I'm interpreting, you know, what was happening then to what the current activities that are happening now. Right. It's gaslighting to say, OK, what you're doing now is actually the racism. in, in terms yeah. of what DEI is, words are being co-opted, um, the word woke and what that used to mean yeah. to what it means now and how people are taking these little bite sized chunks and putting it out there as almost a propaganda to say, you know, what you're doing is actually racism instead of mm -hmm. we're addressing the issue and, and the impacts of those issues that have had on, you know, centuries and, and et cetera. So I think at this point in time, it's a nod to say, OK, if they they our ancestors, they went through all these different phases and still existed. And that's why we're here. Yeah. Now it's up to us to continue to pick up that mantle and continue to, you know, go and pass it to the next generation. Um, and that's why I think from another conversation, like some of this intergenerational work needs to happen because yeah, you need to get the history from mm -hmm. before in order to continue that um, moving forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that and we're almost to the end of the conversation, unfortunately. But I do want to end with that kind of intergenerational idea mm -hmm. of we do need not only people in the space like ourselves, but older people who have been yeah. in that space, who maybe even are wore out from that space, right. traumatized from that space, right. to be able to give those lessons learned to us mm -hmm. and then younger generations. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I guess 
what advice would you have for people that maybe want to do mm -hmm. work like that or even to younger people that are want to seek information yeah. a lot of young people are activist minded nowadays yeah. oh yeah and so how what advice would you give young mm -hmm. people who want to try and and pick up the mantle yeah. that we're talking about how can young people do that yeah, so for me, you know, being an educator and acknowledging the value in education and the transformative power of education, I yeah. would say find the right information and start on that journey you're reading. That's what my yeah, educational yeah. mentors did to me. Yeah. They, they pointed me in the direction of a few books, a few books. And then you know what happens when you finish a book? You go to the bibliography yeah. and they tell you about all the other books in which that book drew information yeah. from. And yeah. then it just takes off. I think access to that information and like you said it if young people this is a revolutionary thing and revolution has multiple meanings mm -hmm. it started here and it came back around again right all you need is access to the information it's encoded in your dna and you make the decisions talk to the elders we talk about uh you know that the trauma is there because it's unresolved trauma mm -hmm. yeah. right but if I'm an elder and I get a chance to share something with a young person that's revolutionary minded, yeah. they will take my trauma and create triumph. Yeah. And I can rest peacefully from that. Yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. I mean, I think we can end it there for now. I mean, and I, we've really only gotten to the tip of the iceberg of this conversation, but I really want, I appreciate all of you for being here. Um, you're all individually inspiring to me. I see the work that you do in community um, and being one of those younger people that get to take that information and education and example from you all. I just want you to know your work isn't in vain. And thank you so well, much for you. doing thank the work you. that you do. Yeah. And I see you and I acknowledge you. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope everyone is able to join you for the white rage discussion february 15th from 9 a.m to 11 a.m at wned studios this is deja james with partnership for the public good or ppg uniting over 340 organizations working to build a better buffalo if you want to respond to white rage give us your thoughts um, please contact us at E info excuse me at ppgbuffalo.org send us a recording if you'd want a written email comments thoughts be sure to let us know where you're listening from and who you are it is the public good tuesday mornings 11 30 a.m on power 96.5 fm and mix 1080 a.m thank you